my name is Chaminder Rajapaksa, as I was introduced. Uh, so I finished schooling here in Dharmaraja College about many years ago. I'm not going to tell you how long. <laughs> and I went off to the US, and I did one bachelor's degree, a couple of master's degrees, and I made my parents extremely happy. So can you imagine, professionally qualified Gobi Buddhist son residing in the US. I was set. So I called my mother um, a few months later and I said, Mother, I've just landed my dream job. I'm going to be working with the United Nations. She said, great. Where? In New York City, Washington DC, Geneva? I said, no, in Luanda. Where? I'm in Luanda, in Angola, in Africa. Well, that was the end of my marriage prospects, <laughs> but was the start of my international development career. So I worked, Angola was the first country that I worked in. I worked uh, in about 35 countries across the world, um, in um, um, four continents in total. And the work was really challenging. We were trying to solve some of the biggest problems that we face as human beings how to deal with floods, how to deal with droughts, how to, deal, how to develop agriculture, develop irrigation, to ensure that people in villages have water. And I was doing this in, in some very, very difficult places. We were working in countries where, for an example, one out of every 10 babies will not make it to their first birthday. We were working in countries where an adult can expect to live to 50 years. That was the average life. Some of the poorest, most difficult places on earth. For an example, I was working in Angola just three, four years after they just got over a devastating civil war. I was working in Mongolia. It's a country where 30% of the people in that country are nomadic herders. They migrate around the country with large herds of animals and they don't necessarily have a permanent place where they live. I was working in Liberia just about 18 months after they just suffered a devastating Ebola epidemic. I had some very eye-opening experiences through this work. I'll never forget, once I was in Mozambique and we were driving down this dusty, hot road, and I saw a mother and her daughter walk in the opposite way, carrying three five-gallon cans of water. And I was wondering, why were they carrying this water in the middle of the day when the sun was so hot? Why did they do it in the morning? Anyway, we waved, I kept walking, and about maybe kept driving and driving, and about seven kilometers later, I came to a spring, a stream. And I realized that this was the stream that this lady just got her water from. Can you imagine that? She must have woken up at 5 a.m. in the morning, 5 a.m. in the morning, walked at least 10 kilometers, and walked 10 kilometers back in the hot sun to carry 15 gallons of water home. 15 gallons of water, that's about the same amount of water that I use in a shower on a daily basis. Then, a few years ago, I was in Mongolia, like I said. We were, I was developing a climate change project, and we were discussing the project with families who were involved in, uh, in agriculture. I remember walking about, driving 20 kilometers into this, this desert, snowy landscape, and we came to a village where, um, we came to a little hut, where we met a woman and her teen, uh, teenage son. We spoke to them and she said, yeah, life is very difficult. She has about 35 animals, 35 sheep, couple of horses, and that's how she makes a living. So I, uh, she said, you know, life, sh life is difficult, but she does have her teenage son and her daughter to help her. And I asked her, I was like, where's the daughter? Because the son was there, but the daughter was not in the, in, the, in the hut. And she said the daughter has gone to school. Going to school. Going to school meant that this 10-year-old little girl woke up at 5 a.m. in the morning, got on a horse, 
rode 20 kilometers in this and came back in the evening and helped her mother mind her animals. I worked in Mumbai, in Maharashtra, for about three years, a few years ago. I was helping cotton farmers there um, deal with issues that they had. And one of the biggest problems that we had, one of the biggest problems that I had in doing this work was that every single day, about 10 of these farmers committed suicide. And this was because they would go into debt when they started farming, and there would be a drought, and then they would not be able to pay their loans back, and they saw this as the only way out. Why am I telling you these stories? I'm telling you these stories to impress upon you that life is very, very difficult for a lot of people in this world. And with climate change, it's actually going to get a little bit more difficult or a lot more difficult for many people, especially in countries like ours, developing countries. Did you know that 2014 was one of the hot, was the hottest year ever recorded in history since we started recording temperatures in the 1880s? 2015, 2016, 2017 beat 2014. What does this mean? This means that our weather is changing. We are not going to have the same weather patterns that we are used to. It's going to be, it's, it's either going to rain too much or not rain enough. <clears throat> it's either going to be too hot or too cold. Sea level rise will probably result in the fact, sea level rise will probably mean that countries like the Maldives will cease to exist. And even some of our coastal cities will probably get affected severely. In Sri Lanka, we expect that the monsoon will change significantly. We'll most likely have a shorter monsoon, which means that we'll get the same amount of rain in a shorter period of time. Floods, most likely. Also means that our drought, the dry season will increase, which means we will have probably more droughts. But as powerful as these problems are, the solutions can be stronger. I firmly believe that our problems are not going to be solved by do-gooders. They're not going to be solved by environmentalists. They're not going to be solved by big INGOs or international NGOs. They're not going to be solved by people out to save the world. They're going to be solved, they're going to be solved by people who have interesting ideas. The strength and the solution lie with people who want to do interesting things, build scalable businesses that rewards them, but also rewards society and the environment. This may sound a little bit cliche to you, but I honestly think that the climate crisis avoids, affords us amazing opportunities. Opportunities to create Innovate and unleash the power, especially of young people. Unleash the power of dreamers who want to, who see the world and want to make it a better place. By creating op investment opportunities, by creating businesses, by creating jobs. Even governments and companies around the world understand this because last year in 2017, they invested $400 billion just to do that. This is a guy named Chagas. I met him in Minonge, which is a little village way down in the south of Angola. He comes from a subsistence farming family. They own a small plot of land which they farm. He can read and write, but not much more. The guy got together with some of his friends and they created a marketing network. Basically what it meant was that they had people in about 10, 15 different villages and towns in that area. And they would call each other and tell them where the good price was for certain agricultural commodities. So that the farmers would be able to sell their commodities 
at a better price than they used to before and even harvested at the right time. We verified that up to 2,000 farmers earned more money and wasted less product because of the enterprise this fellow started with a bunch of his friends. Ramesh started as a solar panel installer in Jaffna. The guy was installing Chinese-made solar panels on the roofs of houses and businesses in Jaffna. And he thought, why can't we create a solar panel here? Why can't we make it here? So he got one of these Chinese panels, reverse engineered it, and made a workable, working solar panel. He made a bunch of those put it up around, and he's testing them now. He also started this, which is the first renewable energy showroom in the northern province. He wants to manufacture those solar panels here one day. And if he does, he's going to start a sector that can create thousands of jobs. There was two guys named John and Rajendra. The two of them had to wake up in the middle of the night to go turn on the irrigation pump in their chili and onion fields. They, they were 18. They didn't want to get up and run around fields in the middle of the night. So they came up with a solution. They came up with a machine, with a, with a system to turn on the pumps with a mobile phone. Six years later, they have developed that technology. Now they can digitize a farm, right? They have won numerous awards, they have gotten a lot of investments, and they are competing against major international brands. <coughs> Their technology can reduce water usage at a farm by up to 50%. They can reduce electricity use, they can re reduce um, pesticide use, and even fertilizer use at the farm level. When I was in Liberia, I came upon this, this bicycle workshop. <laughs> this bicycle workshop was owned by two young Liberian men. Their business model was to buy broken down, thrown away bikes and fix them up and rent them out by the hour to their neighbors. It was a bike Uber of sorts, probably the first such bike-sharing franchise in the whole of West Africa. These guys, they provide a transportation solution to a city that had very little other options. But even what's nicer, it was a zero-carbon transportation solution. I firmly believe that this is the future. We can unleash the power of youth, ingenuity, and innovation to solve our big, big problems. A tech-savvy young woman, I think, I believe, is a very powerful force of nature that can surpass the power of any government or any INGO, any big international NGO. The solutions to our big problems lie in them. But if we, are to live, if we are to unleash that potential, we have to look at this without our preconceptions. Without the preconceptions of race, religion, caste, class, or what we think of people from their appearance. I truly believe that we can unleash this power by giving our young people a chance to do so. Not through charity, but through confidence, through trust, and mostly through investment. The solution is probably not going to be with that guy you went to college with, who is from the right family and speaks right English but it's going to be with all of our young people. In conclusion, I don't work for the UN or the World Bank anymore. I'm back in Sri Lanka, and this is the force 
I want to help unleash to make Sri Lanka a leading light in the sustainability and green technology field. Thank you very much.